Chapter 36. No regrets. There was an old man in the corner. The server was kind and didn't shoo him away. His face was covered in wrinkles, his cotton clothes were in tatters, and the few strands of hair left on his head were a mess, he gave off the general impression of having shrunk in the wash. With both hands joined in supplication, he bowed to every passerby whilst knelt on the ground, a chipped bowl by his side. As he observed the grandpa, Zhang Chengling could still hear Cao Wei Ning's dissertations ring in his ears. As they say, the chrysanthemum's perfume in the bitter frost blooms. Brother A Cao, that can't be right. Chrysanthemums bloom in autumn, autumn isn't that cold, is it? A, have you ever noticed how poets always complain about nothing? It just shows that they aren't a tough lot, and I bet you one t find a single farmer amongst them. In fact, they are mostly lay bouts who get worked up about the wind and the moon while cooped up in their studies, you see. So it's pretty normal that they wouldn't know when chrysanthemums bloom. Oh, of course. They are just a bunch of mouth farting bookworms who don't know nothing. Ha ha ha. Cao Wei Ning and Gu Xiang debating the finer points of poetry was a spectacle that could drive anyone insane. After enduring it for what felt like hours, Zhang Chengling finally could take it no longer. He fished out a few copper coins from his pocket, walked downstairs, and bent down to plop the change into the grandpa's begging bowl. Thank you, good Samaritan, thank you, the old man mumbled. May Guan Yin, the compassionate and merciful bless and protect you. Though his lips pursed of their own accord, Zhang Chengling forced out a smile. He reflected that, if anything, it was his dad who had been the good Samaritan. And the heavens had protected and blessed him all his life, too. Until one night, the gods above forgot to check on him because they went drinking, and he ended up dead. Apparently, good people had to rely on the protection of the heavens, but bad people could live their evil lives as they wished. Laughable, wasn't it? He sat down on the steps and absent-mindedly muttered the rhymes Zhou Zishu had taught him. As he recited the complex verses, he looked like a little monk chanting sutras. Soon, his gaze and mind wandered far away. Why isn't Shifu back yet? He wondered. Scolding me is sure to be the first thing Shifu does when he returns. Why am I so stupid? No longer a child but not yet an adult, the teenager was going through a furious growth spurt. The clothes Zhao Jing had ordered from the tailor when he had arrived at the Zhao estate only a few months ago were already looking small on him. The legs of his trousers were a good chunk too short, the hems flapping ridiculously as they hung above his ankles. Zhang Chengling bent down to pluck at them, rolling them up and unfurling them back down. It's not as if I'm being stupid on purpose. Who wouldn't want to be smart? Then I could learn Kung Fu faster, and avenge my family sooner. He remembered how, when he was still a small kid and his Kung Fu teacher went to complain about him, his father had only patted him on the head. Please have some patience with him his dad had said to the teacher with an apologetic smile. Just like how the fingers on a hand aren't of the same length, not everybody can be equally talented. That child of mine went through a bout of fever when he was small, and is a bit slower. But he is still a good kid. And it's not as if we expect him to become someone grand. It'd be quite good enough if he can look after himself. For kings and emperors to exist on earth, weren't commoners also necessary? Zhang Chengling was quite sure that he was born the material of a commoner, but the heavens just wouldn't let him have his peace, and were forcing him to grow into somebody like his Shifu, or Uncle Zhao. Wasn't that the same as not wanting him to survive? He was still young, and there were many things his juvenile brain couldn't make sense of. He couldn't make sense of the rhymes his Shifu taught him, couldn't make sense of the sword patterns Mr. Wen showed him, couldn't make sense of his fate. He could make even less sense of what path he should take. An abrupt thought came to the surface of his mind, if I can't survive, then I should just die. To wish for death was a painful thing, and Zhang Chengling's eyes stung as tears welled up inside them. But then, he recalled his Shifu telling him with that stern face of his are you a man or not to be leaking horse piss all the time? And he forced himself not to cry. As he waged war on his own nature, Zhang Chengling didn't notice the black-veiled musician and the drinker who, whilst they plucked at the strings of their lute, slowly closed in on him. The mood was strange between Joe's issue and when K. Singh as they strode along one after the other. They were about to leave the small alley when a woman's frightened cry echoed from nearby. Joe's issue halted his steps. Immediately afterwards, a white silhouette flashed before both men's eyes and the green temptress was dumped down from the sky like some heap in a burlap sack, hitting the ground with a thud before rolling to the side. Lee Quine Cow struggled to crawl up to her feet but failed, doubtless because her acupoints were sealed. 
The person who'd be so cavalier in their treatment of a lady that they'd casually toss them about was none other than the glutton Yi Bai Yi. Yi Bai Yi pointed at the prone woman and addressed Joe's issue. Who's that grotesque looking mad bitch? Those words were like a lethal stab into Lu Quine Kao's worst frailty, and she glared a thousand daggers at the man wearing white. They also made Joe's issue realize why Yi Bai Yi was such a freak. The guy must have been single all his life because if any woman could stand a piece of trash like him, pigs might not only sprout wings, they'd fly straight to the heavens. When K Sing hurried over and grabbed Joe's issue's wrist before stepping in front of him, all the while glowering at the new arrival. Indeed, for some unknown reason, Devil Lord Wen seemed to harbor a deep hostility toward old Freak Yi, in a fashion that was perhaps not dissimilar to how a dog would raise their hackles out of instinct to protect their chewing bone. Irate, when K Sing asked, you, again? Why are you haunting us like a bloody ghost? Yi Bai Yi didn't respond. His tolerance of Wen Kaesing seemed to have greatly increased ever since the guy had yapped about taking his life in 10 years time. He merely shot him a look before pointing at Lu Quine Kao again. I followed a thief here, he said coolly. And I was about to catch him, when that woman jumped out of nowhere, blocking my way without explaining why. She let the thief I was chasing escape. Joe Zishu frowned whilst glancing at the still supine woman. A thief? Mr. Yi, what kind of thief is so remarkable that they'd make a detached personage such as you take on the job of a common copper? What did they steal? The Gao estate was burgled on the second night after you two left. Tell me, what else do you think they stole? When K Singh and Joe Zishu looked at each other in astonishment. Who had managed to rob the tightly guarded Gao estate? Yi Bai Yi cast a glance at Joe Zishu. Little punk, he said, you'd better watch out. Shen Shen is dead. As fast on the draw as Joe's issue was, he couldn't help from having a moment's pause, thinking, what does Shen Shen's death have to do with me? Why should I watch out? But before he could open his mouth, when K Sing spoke for him. So what? Yi Bai Yi didn't answer. Instead, he looked up past the two of them whilst a faint crease appeared between his brows, the stone-faced guy was frowning. A derisive snort sounded from behind them, then. Of course it has something to do with you, someone said. Sir Gao received a note on the day you left. It said, trade the lapis armor for Zhang Chengling's life. Worried for his old friend's son, Sir Shen went after whoever sent the message. He was already a corpse when we caught up. There was a second note in his fist, identical to the first one. Then, on that very night, Gao estate was burgled. So tell me, how can it not have something to do with you? Zhou Zishu knew that a crowd had arrived from the chaotic commotion of footsteps behind him. With sudden misgivings, he turned around to see that the man who just spoke was Kang Shan's grandmaster, Huang Dao Ren, the one he had sent flying with a strike of his palm. Huang Dao Ren appeared awfully pleased with himself. Combined with his shifty eyes and potato face, his smug airs made him resemble a large rat with its tail sticking straight up to the heavens. Zhou Zishu didn't know why, but his fist and feet itched to send the guy flying again. Yu Kuaiufeng stood a few steps behind Huang Dao Ren. By contrast, his expression was rather dour when he said, Could Mr. Zhou, who so brazenly took away the Zhang boy in front of everyone the other day, explain what has happened to the kid? Where is he now? As the saying went, the cold unbinds with false winds. Ever since the night of autumnal rain, the temperature in Dongting had dropped. Yet, the grandmaster of Hua Shan school still carried a fan in his hand. With his way of articulating each word as if trying to bite them whilst he interrogated Joe's issue in the middle of the street, the man did bear the air of a solitary hero facing down the world, that, or everyone else was giving him a wide berth because they couldn't stand the icy breeze issued by his iron fan. Joe's issue lowered his head and chuckled. So, he said. Does everybody here think that? I not only kidnapped Zhang Chengling to get my hand on his piece of the lapis armor, but I'm also holding him hostage to ransom the other two fragments from the Gao estate? Isn't that the case? Huang Daoran asked. Zhou Zishu looked up, toward the sky, and exhaled a light sigh. My mistake, he said whilst shaking his head. How could I have imagined for a second that a pig's brain could come up with human thoughts? Well, a fault confessed is half redressed, when K Sing supplied helpfully. You. Huang Daoran was about to pounce when Yu Kuaiufeng snapped his fan shut with a clack. Maybe Mr. Zhou could explain his presence in this place, then? He said. We came here with young Sir Yi because we're giving chase to a thief who had been sneaking around the Gao estate. But instead of the thief, we found the two of you, alongside. 
He swept a glance downward and met Lu Quincao's gaze. The woman shuddered as if she'd just been splashed with a bucket of cold water, whereas Yu Quiyufeng let out a chuckle. "Huh?" he uttered in a slow voice. "Would that be Lu Quincao, the ever-changing and unpredictable green temptress of legend? Why, this is a blessed day indeed for my humble self to behold the ladies." True figure. Lu Quincao's reputation was obviously rotten. As soon as the words green temptress left Yu Quiyufeng's mouth, surprise, disdain, and even disgust suffused the faces in the gathered crowd. With her acupoint sealed by Yi Bai Yi, the woman could only lay supine on the ground, unable to get up even after she had exhausted her full might. Her face was flushed red, making the scar marring her features appear as if it were swelling up again, in a sight that was all the more sinister. Out of the blue, Zhou Zishu recalled the entrance she had made at the drinkery. How she had held her gaze aloof while sashaying in with effortless, fairy-like grace, attracting everybody's attention in a mere split second. He knew she didn't deserve it, but in that moment he couldn't help but feel pity. Were mere looks that important? Lu Quincao opened her mouth whilst she gazed at Yu Quiyufeng, as if she were about to say something. Her lips trembled twice, but then she remained silent. Suddenly, Yi Bai Yi spoke. He didn't do it. Yu Quiyufeng chuckled. Sir Yi. You are still young and have been living perched on Everbright Mountain. You wouldn't know about the duplicity in people's hearts. If Mr. Zhou wants to claim he has nothing to do with it, then I'd like to ask him if he dares strip out of his clothes, so he can show us whether there's a demon's tattoo on his waist. When Kay Sing's reaction was instantaneous, what? He yelled. Even if he strips, it won't be for you. Who the hell do you think you are? Yu Quiyufeng ignored him, his attention wholly dedicated to Zhou's issue. Mr. Zhou, do you refuse? He asked. Would that perhaps be because there is something on your person that you're ashamed of and can't let people see? Something he was ashamed of and couldn't let people see? All of a sudden, Zhou's issue felt between laughter and tears as he tasted the absurdity of the situation. There was no tattoo on his lower back, but he did have seven nails on his chest. Wouldn't those also qualify as something he was ashamed of and couldn't let people see? Laughter one. What should I be ashamed of? Really? Zhou Zishu wondered whilst he burst out in mirth. Back when the former emperor was still alive, I was the one who devised the stratagems that annihilated the second prince's gang and ferreted out a cluster of court vermin. Back when the barbaric north tribes invaded the central plains and besieged the capital, I was the one who held the Chengwu Gate without retreating a single step in the face of death. If the realms of Daqing are in the present days slowly recovering from the tumults of tempests and storms, from the scars and ravages of wars, if the land is nowadays showing signs of revival, with peace enduring enough for people to get on with their lives, and prosperity abundant enough for your idle bunch to get into dog fights on full bellies, who else other than I was behind the scene, single-handedly executing all the unspeakable deeds that led to your vaunted golden era? I may have been cruel, and I may have killed, but today. With my crippled body and wretched lifespan, I can still pretend to do some good in this world to accumulate merits. Because, from the beginning to the end, I can search my heart and find no regrets. So, yes, what should I be ashamed of? Zhou Zishu glanced at Yu Quiyufeng. Then, after a silence, he spoke in the quietest voice. That's quite right. Who the hell do you think you are? Chapter Thirty Seven, The Farce. In the decade he had spent as half a ghost, his mind had been set in stone. He never hesitated nor doubted. At fifteen and still a child, he shouldered the responsibility of leading the Four Seasons Estate. At eighteen, he met by chance the Crown Prince Helian Yi, who sparked within him a youthful zeal. By age twenty-three, he had single-handedly established Skylight. He had done it all. Although the annals of history would leave out his name, each mountain and river in the land were monuments to his accomplishments. As if in bitterness, Joe Zishu had spoken with a faint curl touching the corners of his lips. Yet, when he swept his gaze across the crowd, his eyes shone cold. Huang Daorun felt himself cower under that glare and was taken with a sudden urge to retreat. But then he spied Yu Quiyufeng in his peripheral vision and forced himself to hold still. Huang Daorun had always thought that Yu Quiyufeng and his deceased son were all appearances without substance. Pretty to look at good-for-nothings who relied on the erstwhile reputation of their declining school to hang in with the other major clans. If he helped the Dainy guy time after time, it was only out of consideration for the long-standing cordial ties between Hua Shang and Kang Shan. That way, he could brag about how much of an honorable man who valued loyalty he was. Plus, he also kind of pitied the fool. 
in front of such a pathetic and contemptible man, how could he back down? Huang Daorun mentally gauged the crowd behind him and immediately felt brassy again. With so many of us, he thought, we could each step on you the once, and you'd still be trampled into noodles. Hence it was with ample chutzpah that he shouted, what are you talking to him for? Let's seize him and bring him back. He'll crack soon enough under interrogation. The guy's yell exploded like a firecracker right by Yu Kuaifeng's ear. Yu Kuaifeng frowned and tilted his head away whilst, out of habit, he ventilated himself a few times with his painted fan. Having to pal around with an oaf like Huang Dao Ren couldn't vex him more. As if his unappealing exterior weren't enough, the guy's manners were also about as refined as those of a mountain yokel. Even a butcher slicing up pork at the market stall had more grace. Incapable of complex thoughts, yet forever bouncing around, he could be heard from villages miles away whenever he opened his mouth, as though he feared people would forget about his existence. As he eyed Zhou's issue with an icy smile frozen on his lips, Yu Kuaifeng didn't acknowledge Huang Dao Ren's harangue. If Hua Shan's prestige hadn't slumped in recent years, he thought, and I didn't need to worry about preserving alliances, would I be broing it out with a bollocks head like him? If the half-wit wants to lead the charge, he can go ahead. That way he'll test the waters first. Which is just as well considering that it's hard to tell how skilled those two really are, and the ancient monk's disciple hasn't indicated his position yet. Thus, an awkward situation arose. Huang Daorun had intended for Yu Kuaifeng to respond and take over after his battle cry, then for the crowd behind him to swarm in. That way, he could have saved himself any trouble and watched smugly from the sidelines. It turned out, Hua Shan's grandmaster didn't react at all and only waited for him to lead the assault. The mob behind him likewise didn't budge an inch, everybody looking at him in expectant confusion. Tens of people clogged the narrow alley but, in that moment, a pin drop silence came over them as not a single person spoke nor moved. When Kei Singh was witnessing such an odd scene for the first time in his life. He had always been the sort to laugh whenever he felt mirth, cry whenever he felt sad, and be a right jackass just because he could. So it was with little concern for the feelings of the heroes present that he rocked back and forth whilst he burst into cackles. Gasping for air, he pointed at Huang Dao Ren and jeered. Boo, did you guys miss the rehearsal and forget your lines? Boo, off with you. Don't pretend to take to the stage and sing an opera when you can't even find your beat. Nobody's going to tip. Yi Bai Yi, who had been watching from the side, said, what a ridiculous mess. With that, he turned and left, no longer interested in even Lu Quine Cao. In a flash of white, he was gone without a trace. Zhou Zishu felt that the whole thing wasn't as much of an opera as it was a farce. He too decided to ignore the lot. He was already setting off when Huang Dao Ren intervened again. Don't you dare leave, little punk. The guy shouted before he pounced. Zhou Zishu didn't even glance back. His silhouette seemed suddenly taller as he squared up and snapped, go climb a tree already. Then, with a whirl of his sleeves, Joe's issue sent out two blasts of energy that hit his assailant with pinpoint accuracy, one impacting him in the shoulder, the other in the knee. Huang Dao Ren went flying. To add insult to injury, there was an actual plum tree nearby, and Huang Dao Ren unfortunately landed in its branches, as if he were a filial kid obeying his granddaddy's command. When Kei Sing guffawed so hard he had to brace himself against the wall, unable to stand straight. He was finding out that Joe's issue wasn't only adorable, he also possessed a flair for jest that he himself wasn't aware of. The whole thing was too amusing for words. He hadn't yet finished laughing, however, when the comedy took a tragic turn. With everyone's attention focused on Zhou's issue, Yu Kuaifeng turned to the har haring man. He unsheathed his sword in a hiss of metal, and thrust it toward Wen Kei Sing's throat without warning. Although his every word had been aimed at Zhou's issue earlier, as if he hadn't even noticed when Kei Sing's presence, Yu Kuaifeng had in fact furtively observed him all along, the stylish Hua Shan Grandmaster would have remembered the man who had made him literally and metaphorically eat dirt in front of so many people even if when Kei Sing was already ashes at the crematorium. Indeed, Yu Kuaifeng felt his very virility would be called into question if he didn't redress that grudge. When Kei Sing pushed himself off the wall and canted backwards to dodge, at a near horizontal angle, Relentless, Yu Kuaifeng's sword was a flutter as it swished through the air, each stroke more vicious than the last. Perplexed, when Kei Sing wondered what it was about. He had been truly drunk that other day, so wasted he couldn't have told his own name. He had long since forgotten his little mix-up with Grandmaster Yu. But then, even if he had remembered their altercation, he would have derided it, Yu Kuaifeng wasn't some young lady who had to be pretty. 
So what if he took a little tumble? How big a deal could it be? Convinced of being an innocent passerby, when K. Singh felt wronged indeed, the other man was acting as if he had slept with his wife, but men didn't generally have male wives. Say, what's that about now? He asked whilst falling back again and again, without retaliating. You're a heretic who uses underhanded tricks, Yu Kuai Feng said with a bleak smile. Scorn and punishment are only your just desserts. Talking won't get you anywhere. Die. When K. Singh twisted to the side to duck another stab, he reached out two fingers, pinching with accuracy Yu Kuai Feng's blade between them. My just desserts? He replied with a likewise icy smile. Pardon me, but I'm not some rat in the granary, so do be kind, won't you? Don't take yourself for rat poison to come at me like you have a grudge. With that, he emitted a faint huff, and Yu Kuai Feng's sword snapped between his digits. Amongst Wu Lin, destroying someone else's weapon was an offense the severity of which was only second to the murder of the person's parents or the kidnapping of their spouse. Yu Kuai Feng's eyes reddened with rage. He aimed a punch at Wen Kei Sing's chest whilst his foot flew up, targeting Wen Kei Sing's crotch. The move was so swift, it was obviously honed through assiduous practice. Fortunately for him, Huang Dao Ren had climbed a tree, and the crowd of merry onlookers had reacted at last, they remembered that they came here to eradicate evil and were at the moment all pestering Zhou's issue. Nobody saw that, in a corner, Hua Shan's grandmaster was using the ball's tickle kick. Ha! Huh. Strange events happen all the time, but this year had them in spades. When Kei Sing twisted aside, he raised his knee and knocked into Yu Kuai Feng's tibia, shattering it with a crack. Simultaneously, he parred Yu Kuai Feng's punch with a palm strike. Yu Kuai Feng felt a lethal energy that was like a tidal wave surge at him and he tried to withdraw his arm in alarm. But it was too late. His fist was caught as if sucked in by Wen Kei Sing's blow, and the tsunami of the assaulting chi flooded his meridians, overloading him almost to the point of making him explode. The panicked Yu Kuai Feng glimpsed Wen Kei Sing's expression then, the face of the always smiling, never serious man in front of him had grown sinister. Cold and eerie in its detachment, it looked like the face of a demon, one that had killed people like squishing flies and without an ounce of remorse. At that moment, a woman's shrill cry rang through the air, and a cluster of needles as thin as an ox's hair hurtled at Wen Kei Sing on a gust of fierce breeze. Out of reflex, Wen Kei Sing let go of Yu Kuai Feng's arm, he struck at the air with a countering blast that scattered the flying needles and rushed at his female assailant. His blow was mighty. Unable to dodge, the woman was impacted in the chest and she flew back, crashing hard into the wall. Only then did when Kei Sing realize who had tried the sneak attack on him, Lu Kuan Kao had unsealed her acupoints with no one noticing. When Kei Sing started. But then, he seemed to realize something. He shouted in Zhou Zishu's direction. A Shu. Come over quick. I've spotted a couple of adulterers. Zhou Zishu was lost for words. He turned around to kick away another suicidal attacker, stooped to pick up Lu Quine Cao, and said in a terse tone, Cut it out, let's go. Obedient, when Kei Sing huffed in agreement and plotted along after him. The two of them took flight using Ching Gong and lost the clown who gave them chase. They had already traveled a certain distance when Zhou Zishu came to a halt. He dumped the woman who seemed at death's door under a tree and reached out to check her pulse. When Kei Sing crossed both arms in front of his chest. Great, he said with a sneer. Our reputation for being heretics is going to stick now that you've brought her along. He pondered for a moment before adding with a sigh, all right then, I wasn't that respectable to begin with, anyway. And since you're mine, I'll chalk it up to sticking together come rain or shine, shall I? Joe's issue didn't even spare him a glance. Leaning over to examine Lu Quine Cao's wound, he fished out a small bottle from his robes and briskly stuffed a pill into the expiring woman's mouth, treating the dead horse as a living one. Old Wen, he said. The mouth is an aperture used to speak and eat, not to fart. Stop talking rubbish. If you had used only a fraction more force, you'd have killed her. The nagging annoyed Wen K crossing. But then, the unexpected familiarity of the address old Wen made joy bloom in his heart. He thus happily rationalized all the words that came afterwards as tough love. Lu Quine Cao let out a cough, the faint movement almost making her whole body fall apart. She glowered at Joe's issue. You. She rasped. Why are you pretending to be kind? Joe Zishu paid her no mind and crouched beside her. Tell me, he said. Where did you learn to disguise yourself? Lu Quine Cao started. She hadn't expected that question. But she was quick to recover and replied in a tone that was tough as nails. 
PFFT. What do you care? When K Sing intervened. Miss Lu, could it be that the motivation behind your disguises and quest for the lapis armor all boils down to you, Kwai Feng? Let me give you a piece of advice then. A woman needn't fear being ugly, or even stupid. What she should dread most is being blind. It's truly a wonder that you'd fall for a piece of trash like him. Let me ask you, do you know how Yu Kwai Feng found us in the first place? Or why Yi Bai Yi chased a black clad man into that alley? And who tricked you into thinking that it was Yu Kwai Feng being hunted down, making you clash with Yi Bai Yi? And then, who revealed your identity in front of everybody? Idiot, he's been using you as his meat shield. His words struck straight to the girlish anguishes of the woman who was no longer 16. It was even worse than Yi Bai Yi calling her grotesque looking, and if Lu Quine Kao had had any energy left then, she'd have gnawed when Kei Sing to pieces. Shut it, Zhou Zishu said. When Kei Sing obeyed at once, clamping his mouth shut so tight, it seemed he had only one lip left. For a while, Zhou Zishu scrutinized Li Quine Kao's face whilst he tried to gauge her age. Then, he asked all of a sudden, You. When you were a kid, did you happen to have come across a strange man with no eyebrows and who was fatally wounded? You gave him food? Whilst he was young, Chin Hai's Hang, Zhou Zishu Shifu, had once been hunted down by foes and sought refuge at a farmstead. Critically injured and with not a copper coin about himself, he had reportedly survived those darkest of hours only thanks to a small girl who brought him food in secret. Unable to otherwise repay the kindness, and moved by the sight of her ruined face, he had taught the girl a few techniques on how to mask her appearance. He no doubt never would have imagined the harm his tricks would cause her eventually. Although she didn't respond, astonishment flitted across Lu Quine Kao's features, and Zhou Zishu knew his guess was correct. He lowered his head, pondering for a moment before he took out the bottle of medicinal pills from his breast and set it on the ground beside the woman. Look after yourself in the future, he said. Then he turned and left. Still in high spirits, when Kei Sing followed suit. She schemed to polish you off, he commented. Yet you still were nice to her. Ah Shu, you really are. He trailed off then. Because Zhou Zishu had fished out another small vial from the folds of his clothes and was wiping his face with the solution within. It wasn't apparent at first, but after a few more swipes the complexion of his skin gradually changed. When Kaysing gaped, his eyes widening further and further. Chapter 38. The Ambush. The sallow, waxy complexion that was tinged with green disappeared. It looked like he was slicing off a chunk of flesh when he peeled away a strange contraption from his chin, revealing the bony contours of a chiseled face. Unwittingly, when Kei Sing held his breath as he watched Zhou Zishu take off his disguise with deft fingers. He looked neither like the dimpled and darling dandy from Luoyang, nor the picturesque and powdered upstairs performer from Dongting. His were manly features that resembled a black and white sketch deprived of any colors. Ashen and gaunt cheeks, line thin, bloodless lips, prominent brow bones framing sunken eye sockets, dense lashes half concealing a pair of irises as dark as viscous ink. Yes, in that instant, as dark as viscous ink was the only description with which when Kei Sing could come up. The turbid black of those eyes seemed indissoluble. Only when the angle changed did they glint with an almost imperceptible, muted gloss. When Kei Sing found himself thinking that Zhou Zishu looked just as he should. He'd have pictured that exact face in his mind even if the other man had worn a mask for the rest of his life. Gazing upon it for the first time seemed a mere confirmation of his mental representation. As if. They had known each other for a very long time. When Kei Sing swallowed. Ah Shu. Hmm, Zhou Zishu uttered, absent-minded, as he wiped off the last trace of his disguise. That mask had covered his features for so long, it had become like his own skin. Not having it on actually felt strange. He had planned to take it to the grave too, but a thing called trouble was stalking him like a shadow. Would it mean that from now on he would have to swap faces every two mornings again? Zhou Zishu's spirits instantly plummeted at the thought. When Kei Sing wetted his lips. Did I? Did I mention to you I like men? He said in a low, husky voice. Zhou Zishu shot the guy a sidelong glance that plainly read no kidding, as if I could have missed the memo. Then, appearing to recall something. He fished out another mask from his breast. Put it on if you don't want more trouble, he instructed as he tossed it over. The craftsmanship of Zhou Zishu's second skin disguises was superlative. Had it been any other day, when Kei Sing would doubtless have examined the object with interest. At the moment, however, he had eyes only for the other man and didn't spare it a single glance. 
His tone was solemn when he spoke again. Is this why you are trying to seduce me right now, then? Joe Zissou had lived to his age thinking himself a manly man from head to toe. He could honestly say that no other guy had ever flirted with him in such a serious tone while simultaneously leering at him with so depraved a gaze. It only verified his long-standing opinion that there was something wrong with when Kay Singh's eyes or brain, the latter was either a few gears short or several nuts too many. Why else would the guy amuse himself with needling him on purpose all day long, whilst he could pester the plentiful pretty lads and lasses prancing around on the streets? Hence, Joe Zissou ignored him. He pulled out another mask to don, and kept walking. An axis shift between heaven and earth took place for when K. Singh to witness then. Under his gaze, the handsome stunner morphed into a creepy middle-aged dude affected with strabismus. The sight was so tragic and the permutation so brutal, when K. Singh felt as if his stomach got flipped over in the commotion whilst he desperately wished for bleach into which to plunge his eyeballs. Arg! It hurts the eyes too much. Change it for another. He screamed as he reached out to help the other man do away with the offending horror. Thinking that the guy was hamming it up, Joe Zissou dodged by tilting his face to the side. He didn't expect when K. Singh's jealous, continued assaults. And thus, with external threats temporarily removed, the two men who had not an hour ago presented a united front in the face of common foes, reverted to a state of internal unrest and domestic dispute, resulting in an outbreak of fisticuffs on the spot. As they traded blow for blow, Joe Zissou threw a punch at the guy's collarbone that when K. Singh neither blocked nor ducked. He hadn't planned on crippling the other man for real, so Joe Zishu shifted his aim two inches upwards. His fist flew out whilst grazing Wen K. Singh's shoulder. Wen K. Singh, however, only seized the occasion to capture his hand into his own. Hey, let's discuss something, he said, face aglow with laughter. Since you're single too, how about the two of us just shack up to get by? The guy spoke with his customary grin. The one that turned his eyes into two unreadable curved lines as if he were trying to hide the expression in them on purpose. As if he were trying to make it impossible to tell whether or not he was sincere. Irritated, Joe Zishu asked, what would I want you for? When K. Singh leaned in closer, lifted Joe Zishu's hand until it was level with his face, and lightly rubbed against it with the point of his chin. Immediately afterwards, while Joe Zishu was busy wrenching his arm away with goosebumps rising all over his body, he reached out, yanked the mask from Joe Zishu's face and tossed it away. You tell me, he replied in a lowered voice. Joe Zishu rolled his eyes. Then, face impassive, he observed Wen K. Singh for a minute before he abruptly burst out into giggles. The paleness in the man's face was far too pale, and its shadows too deep, it gave him an air of haughtiness and detachment. Only in laughter did his brows relax as fine lines appeared by the corner of his mouth, his lips taking on a faint blush. He looked quite adorable like that. The adorable man likewise lowered his voice to make his retort. Keep you around, so I can slice you up and eat you in case a famine hits? His voice was a deep, dangerous whisper, with a pause after each word. It made when K. Singh's hair stand on end. He hardly had time to savor what it meant when Joe Zishu kicked him. Hard. When K. Singh's knees buckled, and he avoided prostrating himself by the breadth of a hair. It gave ample room for Joe Zishu to shake him off and march away. As the man left with a smug strut, he fished out and put on another mask, this one even more gods angeringly ugly than the last. While those two fellas had sauntered off to frolic and cavort about, Zhang Chengling was still seated by himself on the flight of stairs, lost in existential contemplation. He wasn't sure what happened, but the next thing he knew, Gu Xiang had grabbed him by the back of his collar and tossed him aside. A second later, blood splashed on his face and screams rose all around. Gu Xiang's pretty face had turned grim as blood dripped from the dagger she held. Under her foot lay the severed hand of the black-clad lutist who'd been ambling about. Alongside a small, checkered viper cut up in two. With their face deathly pale, the lutist escaped by jumping out of the window. Gu Xiang figured the place was no longer safe. She hauled up Zhang Chengling and said to Cao Wei Ning, let's go, we need to leave. She had just finished speaking when a dozen black-clad men emerged out of nowhere, each of them armed with a hook. The second wave of suicide scorpions had shown up. Everyone in the drinkery, the server included, scampered off before things got worse without a care given about the bills for the food. What's going on? Why did those people turn up all of a sudden? What do they want? Cao Weining asked in a single breath. With her dagger in hand, Gu Xiang trailed a glance over their assailants. She felt sweat collect in her palm and adjusted her grip on her weapon by flipping it around in a small arc, 
all the while inwardly grumbling about the situation. Getting ambushed by that bunch now was just her luck. It'd be easy enough for her to charge out and flee, but if anything happened to the brat while she was babysitting, wouldn't her master flay her alive? Yeah, that'd be his style. The scorpions, too, seemed wary of Gu Xiang as they approached slowly from all sides. Out of the corner of her eye, Gu Xiang spied the hazy-looking Cao Wei Ning and the obviously unmighty Zhang Chengling, and deeply tasted the bitterness of the line bleak as the gale that blows, freezing her rivers flows it sure was the most unfortunate moment in her life. Scorpion suicide assassins, remember? She said to Cao whining in a clipped voice. They want to kill the brat. Cao whining oh Ed, catching up at last, the two muggers who died at the Gao estate had the same fashion style. He instantly tensed up and drew out his sword, telling Zhang Chengling near him, don't leave my side. Gu Xiang's delicate brows knitted as she decided that gaining the initiative by striking first was their best course of action. She pulled out a handful of throwing stars, scattered them at the scorpions like they cost no money, and the free-for-all began. Although Gu Xiang, whom Zhou Zishu suspected of being the Devil's Valley Purple Fury, may have been young, she still knew many tricks and wasn't at all weak. Although Cao Whining, whose understanding of the poetic arts could chaff anyone's balls, may be sometimes slow on the uptake, he still was Quang Feng Sword School's current top disciple who moreover had never let futile exercises like reading books get in the way of his training. Together, their strength wasn't negligible, and even if they were facing a suicide squad from the Scorpions, they could go for broke and have more than a fighting chance. Trouble was, they also had to protect a little deadweight named Zhang Chengling. In her lifetime of murders and arsons, Gu Xiang had never been so inconvenienced before. Held up by a scorpion, Cao Whining couldn't guard and let another one rush past him, headed straight for Zhang Chengling. Out of desperation, he grabbed the boy and flung him at Gu Xiang. Gu Xiang could only receive the hundred pounds package with a loud ouch, stumbling to the side for several successive steps, and pricking to death a scorpion who almost grappled her hair in the process. As she steadied herself with effort, she stabbed another one in the stomach with the blade that had sprung out at the point of her shoe. The guy took his sweet time to die and tried to launch himself at her again, so she had to finish the job with an additional run-through. The gleam of blades grazed Zhang Chengling's ears, and the shadows of swords flew past the top of his head. Every now and then he reached out with trepidation to check whether something had been sliced off from his person. All the while, he endured Cao Wei Ning and Gu Xiang tossing him back and forth like a bag of potatoes, his vision a blur and his head dizzy as he waltzed on the breeze. When the melee came to a temporary intermission, Gu Xiang's trouser legs were already soaked red by enemy blood and she had taken a hook to the waist. Luckily, she'd been swift to dodge or else her comely self would have become her comely self of two halves. All colors had fled her face, and Cao Wei Ning was a wreck that was doing no better. The three of them stood in a vicinity where they seemed to be the only living souls left Gu Xiang came to a prompt decision. We leave now. Or there'll only be more trouble. Quick. With quivering hearts, Cao Whining and Zhang Chengling glanced at each other. They were about to take off after her when someone cried out from a corner. Zhang Chengling turned around to the old beggar crawling out from the pile of corpses. The grandpa was on the verge of pissing his pants from fright. The copper coins from his overturned begging bowl were spilled around him and floating in puddles of blood. Unable to get up, his voice had changed in pitch when he said in a trembling voice, M murder. Cao Wei Ning was from a so-called orthodox school, after all. He had been taught the Confucian virtues since he was small. His brows knitted at once when he realized they had unwittingly caused prejudice to an innocent older person. He rushed over. Elder, are you hurt? The old beggar looked up and stared at him with bleary eyes. Gah! He uttered. It seemed he was so scared, he couldn't speak. Zhang Chengling went over as well. Grandpa, he said in a gentle voice. Hurry and run. Bad guys are coming. Because Zhang Chengling had given him some change earlier, the grandpa appeared to recognize the boy. He reached out to grab at his arms, all the while muttering. Arg, arg, dead people. Gu Xiang was observing them from nearby. Her gaze suddenly hardened, and she leapt forward as fast as lightning, her dagger raised high to hack at the old beggar's hand. Gu Xiang, don't. Cao Wei Ning shouted in alarm. But it was too late. Her blade was already plunging toward the old man. The old man jumped in fright and withdrew his arm surprisingly swiftly. Yet, Gu Xiang was relentless, she changed her attack by swerving her dagger around and thrusting it upward, sinking it into the old man's throat and severing his carotid. Blood sprayed out two feet high. 
Cao whining and Zhang Chengling gaped dumbfounded at the gore-drenched girl who looked like a demonic Asura descended upon earth. Expressionless, Gu Xiang yanked out her dagger from the deceased man's body and offhandedly wiped the blood from her face with her sleeve. When she looked up, she saw the horror mixed in with some other indescribable emotion on the two's faces. What? She asked. Cao Wei Ning pointed at the old man's corpse, stammering. He. He was only. An old vagabond who begged for money. You. You killed him. PFFT, people from orthodox schools. Gu Xiang's eyes grew cold. Not bothering to explain herself, she sheathed her weapon, allowed Zhang Chengling no room for protest as she picked him up, and left. Unexpectedly, Cao Wei Ning caught up with her. After a while and with a cautious manner, he said in a small, fumbling voice. I didn't mean it like that. I wasn't saying that what you did was wrong, Gu Xiang. I don't. And I also don't think you're killing people blindly, it's just. It's just that if you were mistaken, and he was only an ordinary beggar, and. And you found out, I'm concerned that you'd feel sad. Gu Xiang's steps faltered ever so slightly. She was silent for a moment before she said in a brusque tone, Bullshit, what would I be sad for? Cao Wei Ning exhaled a light sigh. Of course you'd be sad, you just don't know it. Gee, we should move along. With Joe and brother went off to who knows where, if another bunch of those scorpions or snakes, whatever, shows up, I'm afraid it'd be other people's turn to feel sad for us. Gu Xiang pursed her lips. Although she said nothing, she thought, that cow guy. Maybe a bit of a bonehead, but wasn't all that bad. Chapter 39. The Fugitives. When Zhou Zishu and when Kei Sing came back, Gu Xiang and company were already gone. They left behind only a pile of corpses that people from the Gao estate were sorting out. A large crowd of onlookers had gathered and surrounded them. When Kei Sing was unused to wearing something on his face and it felt as if the cicada wing thin disguise could fall off at any moment. Uncomfortable, he observed Zhou Zishu, a guy who had been hunted down only moments earlier strut over as if the situation didn't concern him at all. As if he wasn't Joe's issue. He was witnessing for the first time somebody acting so bold while harboring ulterior motives. The second layer seemed indeed to have thickened up Joe's issue's skin. Clicking his tongue in wonder, he followed suit. Several people were investigating the corpses, and Kuang Feng Sword School's Mo Wai Kong was amongst them. Mo Wai Kong's expression was grave, it was clear he had recognized Cao Whining's handiwork. After scrutinizing him for a while, when Kei Sing moved closer to Zhou Zishu. Look at the face the old Mo guy is pulling, he whispered into the other man's ear. That little scamp, Cao Wei Ning, can't have run off from his clan to elope with Gu Xiang, can he? You have a gutter mind, Zhou Zishu replied. With his gaze trailing over the bodies littering the ground, Zhou Zishu's brows knitted as a bad feeling came over him. The Scorpion suicide assassins were a tough lot. Were those two unreliable kids able to handle the situation on their own with the little brat in tow? Were they even alive right now? And where had they run off to? When Kei Sing pondered a moment before he said, with the lapis armor and the scorpions working up a storm throughout the town, I'm sure Gu Xiang would have wanted to seek refuge somewhere with fewer people. Zhou Zishu threw him a glance and promptly extricated himself from the crowd. What are you waiting around for, then? He said. Let's go. The both of them were gone as swiftly as they had come, unnoticed by most. Don't worry, when Kei Sing reassured his companion. Gu Xiang isn't as useless as you think. Moreover, Cao Wei Ning is with them as well. Zhou Zishu looked over with a frown. Why is Valley Master when so concerned by whether the brat lives or dies? When Kei Sing chuckled, the tiny movement making his mask wrinkle. It felt as if it were about to slide off, so he reached up to hold it in place, the gesture looking quite incongruous. Why is Chief Spy Joe so concerned by whether the brat lives or dies? He asked back. He's my disciple. Your disciple is my disciple. Between the two of us, who should rank ahead? Dot, between the two of us, I come first, stop with the rubbish talk. You want information from the brat, don't you? I'll tell you if you give me a kiss, when K Singh said as he fluttered his eyelashes. Unfortunately, the mask on his face was a little shy of being appealing, and what he thought to be an enticing gaze was in fact a sight of horror. Joe's issue looked away in silence, nausea rising in his throat. But then, he reflected that he had only himself to blame. Aren't you afraid of catching mouth sores? He retorted. 
my mouth could rot off and I'd still be willing, when K Singh answered, shameless. And thus, Zhou Zishu ignored the guy once more. After a moment's reflection he continued. Judging from the rapport between Rong Xuan and the Devil's Valley back then, I fear the five clans have acquired the lapis armor precisely from within the valley. With the rumors about the armor leaking out this time around, and Jiang Hu people fighting over it like dogs. Is it possible that a devil has succumbed to temptation and left the valley on their own? A devil who was also implicated in this Hang's massacre, perhaps? And is it possible that you, just like the morning groom, think that Zhang Chengling may have seen who that foolhardy individual was? When Kei Sing took some time to reply. Well, can you tell me who'd know better than him? Zhou Zishu whipped around to look at the guy. Unless there is some other hidden matter at stake, he said. Something so significant it has roused the secretive and seldom sighted devil lord himself? When Kei Sing didn't answer. He merely gazed at Zhou Zishu with expectant eyes whilst pointing at his own lips with a smile. Zhou Zishu feigned having seen nothing. After pondering for a bit, he asked again, if you find that devil, what would you do? Flay their skin and strip out their tendons, then dice them up into a thousand pieces, when Kei Sing answered quietly with a faint smile lingering on his lips. Then, when he saw the conflicted expression on Zhou Zishu's face, he chuckled and added in the tone that made people want to punch him, I'm only scaring you. Oh my. I'm terrified, Zhou Zishu replied with a hollow laugh. What a slippery, sly old fox, when Kei Sing thought. What a two-faced son of a bitch, Zhou Zishu thought. With those praises in mind, the two of them grinned identical hypocritical grins at each other before they resumed hurrying along to get to the other three whilst they still had a breath left. At first, Gu Xiang didn't actually seek a secluded location as when Kei Sing had predicted. Worried that their foes may find it easier to attack if they had no witnesses, the three of them hastily tidied up the bloodstains on their persons and headed toward the city's bustling downtown. Unfortunately, their group of three was too obvious a target and Gu Xiang came to regret her decision not half an hour later. Several people intercepted them, cutting off their path. They were led by Feng Xiao Fang in the mountain. Right behind came an old man and an old woman, one carrying a walking stick in his left hand, and the other carrying one in her right. The grandpa wore clothes of a willow green color from head to toe, and the granny wore a likewise monochromatic ensemble in peach pink. The grandpa dripped with jewelry, he sported at least 10 pounds of gold on his person. The granny was heavily made up, the splendor of her face as bright as the ass of a baboon. Sweat drenched Cao Wei Ning's palm at once, that couple of old folks were even trickier to shake off than Feng Zhou Feng. They were none other than the infamous pink matron and verdant gent. A pair of old crooks who may be venerable in age but were capable of the most shameless acts. Feng Xiao Feng's high-pitched laugh trilled in the air. Zhang Chengling, have you forgotten that you were the scion of an orthodox clan? Every hero in the land has gathered to avenge your family, but what did you do? You ran off with a couple of heretics from who knows where. Are you trying to resuscitate your dead father by making him so angry he'll rise from his grave? Zhang Chengling's face fell at once. Clumsy with words, he had never been good at verbal sparring and could only yell back, You. You're talking drivel. My Shifu and Mr. Wen are good people. The slash on Gu Xiang's waist she had received from a scorpion's hook was still bleeding. Even though she had gulped down the antidote to the venom, the wound still hurt to the point she'd been continuously dripping cold sweat. Any patience she possessed had deserted her a long time ago. Cut out the bullshit. She snapped. Feng Zhou Feng, get the fuck out of your mama's way. Don't think I can't cut you down just because you're short. Feng Zhou Feng's reaction was immediate. Where did that rotten girl come from? He shrieked as he pulled out a machete from behind his back and pounced. Cao Wei Ning hurriedly unsheathed his own sword to intercept the machete. He still tried to reason with the dwarf. Sir Feng, A Xiang is your junior. Please don't demean yourself by descending to her level. If word got out, wouldn't it debase your mighty reputation? Feng Xiao Feng's attention had been focused on Zhang Chengling and he noticed the lad only then. He gave a start and asked in surprise, You're that kid from Kuang Feng Sword, aren't you? How did you get mixed up with that lot? Sir, Cao Wei Ning said with an apologetic smile. Surely, there must be some misunderstanding. Feng Xiao Feng snorted and lifted his machete, only for the pink matron to cut in from behind him. Since that's so, old Feng, you may as well hold back. Kid, you did well by bringing the little brat in. It'd count as a charitable deed, and your granny here can tell you that you have a bright future ahead of you. 
Beads of cold sweat rolled down Cao Wei Ning's temples as he restrained Gu Xiang from making the situation worse while simultaneously being circumspect of the people blocking their way. Ah, but of course. Many thanks, venerable elder, he mumbled. The pink matron waved her hand in a dismissive gesture that was less than polite. Zhang Chengling, come with us, she said in a commanding tone. Zhang Chengling immediately took two steps back, fixing her with a pair of wide and wary eyes. Cao Wei Ning stepped sideways to stand in front of him, blocking him from view. Let's clear up something first, please, the young man said. Venerable Elder, have you come out to look for Zhang Chengling on Sir Gao or Sir Zhao's behalf? The pink matron let out a bleak chuckle and glared at him. Little punk, what makes you think you can question me? Cao Wei Ning retreated a few steps with Zhang Chengling behind him. Elder, please forgive me, he said in a tense voice. But I'm helping someone look after little brother Zhang, and wouldn't dare entrust him to just anyone. If I had to hand him over, it'd have to be to Sir Zhao or Sir Gao themselves. The verdant gent thumped the ground with his walking staff and sneered. Little punk, you seem to think yourself quite the character, don't you? But let me tell you what, the boy is coming with us today whether or not you let him go. Before he had finished speaking, the old man had already converged with the pink matron, and both raised their walking staffs to smash at Cao Wei Ning's head. Cao Wei Ning didn't dare chance their luck further. He retreated another step and, parrying with his sword, he turned to Gu Xiang. Take him with you and leave first. Hurry. He said to her. Gu Xiang was quick to judge the situation. Cao Wei Ning was from an orthodox school, so that bunch of old freaks would have to show some mercy because they'd be afraid of Mo Wai Kong and Mo Wai Yang's wrath. No matter what, they wouldn't dare kill Cao Wei Ning. Thus, she didn't hesitate further. You take care, she said as she picked up Zhang Chengling and ran off in another direction. Feng Xiao Feng, however, wasn't going to let them off so easily. He launched himself in hot pursuit. Gu Xiang's eyes hardened. She withdrew both hands into her sleeves before she shoved Zhang Chengling backwards, dodging the dwarf. Then, she used her momentum to pounce toward the mountain. The mountain's meteor hammer was already hurtling at her, she ducked again and raised her arm in a sudden movement as she flung a handful of white powder at the giant. The mountain couldn't dodge and got a faceful, he immediately started yowling while his eye sockets reddened and swelled up. Unable to open them, the giant reached out to rub at his face. It only made things worse as blood seeped out. The trick was a vicious one. Gu Xiang had used poison and the mountain would never see again. Feng Xiao Feng whipped around at once. Ah Shan, what? What's happening to you? He cried out in alarm. The mountain only yowled like a wounded beast as he scratched at his eyes with yet more force. Feng Xiao Feng bolted over to hold his arm back and the two of them rolled around on the ground. It was with an immense effort that the dwarf sealed the giant's acupoints. When Feng Zhoufeng saw his friend's eyes, it was as if his innards had imploded in fury. Little bitch, don't you dare leave. He bellowed. But Gu Xiang and Zhang Chengling had already vanished without a trace. Crowded areas were a no-go, so Gu Xiang fled toward the outskirts of town while dragging Zhang Chengling along. She was so anxious, it felt as if her heart was on fire. One moment, she'd fret over whether at least one of that pair of clowns, her master or Zhou Xu, would manage to find them. Next, she'd be worrying over whether the trick she used out of desperation would enrage Feng Xiao Feng to the point he'd take it out on Cao Wei Ning. Had she doomed the silly guy to his death? She hardly had time to agonize over Cao Wei Ning's fate, however, as they ran straight into the third wave of suicide scorpions. The latter had been lying in wait in a small woody area that was a mandatory passage on the road which led out of town. Gu Xiang wept inwardly. With her injury, she didn't know how long she'd last and there wasn't a single person nearby she could ask for help. She stuffed a dagger into Zhang Chengling's hand and hurled him away with all her might. Run! She yelled. Then, like a bird taking flight, she soared upward, bracing herself to greet the incoming foes. Not even knowing where he was headed, Zhang Chengling scrambled forward into the wood, rolling and tumbling along the way. As he ran, tears fell from his eyes. Why am I so useless? He thought. Why am I always bringing others down? First, it had been Shifu, now it's big brother Cao, and sister Gu Xiang's turn. Yet reality didn't give him time to wallow in sorrow for lost springs and bygone autumns. Several shrill whistles trilled through the air, and four black-clad men popped up out of nowhere, cutting off his paths from every direction. Zhang Chengling froze on the spot. 
The short dagger Gu Xiang had just given him felt like a child's toy in his hand as the black-clad assassins closed in on him, the hooks they wielded gleaming coldly. But then, all of a sudden, a murderous rage rose within Zhang Chengling. Why do you all want me dead? He thought. What did I do? Why can everybody else live, but I can't? A black-clad man dashed forward, his hook aimed at Zhang Chengling's chest like a giant scorpion sting. Zhang Chengling put his left foot forward whilst, out of nowhere, he recalled what Wen Kei Sing had taught him on that other night. Like the fierce hawk diving to capture the hare. Like the released arrow that sees no return. To buttress his weakness. To oppress his strength. Zhang Chengling twisted around and jumped up, stepping on a tree trunk to leap yet higher before he plunged toward the cold shine of his opponent's weapon. His mind in that instant was empty but for three words, to the death. His dagger met the scorpion's hook in a clang of metal whilst when Kei Sing's voice sounded again in his ear. Changed before exhaustion. The sword's stroke shall be like buoyant flowers and waves. Unstable and floating. Changed when depleted. The sword's stroke shall be like a thousand variations reunited. All of them in one blow. As the scorpion twisted his weapon to parry his dagger, his hook caught Zhang Chengling's hand, and Zhang Chengling's arm flew out although he'd exhausted his full might to bear down. He spun around and put all his strength into thrusting his hand forward, plunging the dagger into the scorpion's chest. To his astonishment, the scorpion died without so much as emitting a sound. Hardly able to believe what just happened, a tumult of successive emotions surged within him. Joy, terror, then a haze of complex feelings that he had yet to detangle when another scorpion appeared in front of him. Zhang Chengling raised his arm to protect himself, but discovered with horror that the cut left on his hand by the other assassin's hook was swelling up in a black bruise. Immediately afterwards, he felt all strength leave his body as his vision blurred. Unable to hold himself up anymore, he collapsed to his knees. As despair engulfed him, he closed his eyes and thought, am I going to die now? But the fatal blow did not come. Zhang Chengling waited for a long time before he cracked an eye open to sneak a peek around, only to see that his attacker had received an arrow to his heart. The scorpion's eyes widened to the point of bursting from their sockets before he toppled to the ground with a loud thud. A man's voice echoed from behind him, then. Are your lot murdering people in broad daylight? Since when have the customs in Dong Ting become so unseemly? Chapter 40. The Seventh Lord. Zhang Chengling felt dizzy and knew that it must be from the scorpion's poison. Rumbling noises echoed in his ears like thunder whilst the sounds from his surroundings seemed to reach him through a veil of muslin, he could hear, but nothing sounded real. He turned his face in the direction the arrow came from and saw two men. The fellow who held a small crossbow in his hand wore a long robe of a navy blue color, his large sleeves billowing on the breeze. A belt that was the width of a palm cinched his waist, a xiao flute made of white jade attached to it. He didn't look like a Zhanghu dweller, or a scholar. More like some landowning noble who bathed in luxuries. At first glance, his pair of peach blossom eyes seemed to retain the hint of a smile, but on a closer peek, his gaze that was directed at the last standing scorpion gleamed with a cold light. In a daze, Zhang Chengling thought that this individual was the best looking person he had ever seen. Another man dressed in black stood by his side with a small marten perched on his shoulder. His face looked as cold as ice. The remaining scorpion seemed to hesitate for a moment before he darted like an arrow toward the man holding the crossbow. Zhang Chengling felt an indescribable icy breeze streak by his ear, and before he knew what happened, the scorpion had turned into a dead scorpion. The man dressed in black, who was still a distance away a mere blink ago, materialized beside him. He stooped to lift up his injured hand and examined it, before he reached out to seal his acupoints. Then, he pressed a medicine pill to his lips and said, ingest it. You've been poisoned with scorpion venom. Without a care for anything else, Zhang Chengling struggled to grab the man's sleeve. Sister. Gu. Xiang. Please save. The words he used all his strength to utter had transformed into a garbled hodgepodge when they left his mouth. But the fellow in the long robe still gave a start, appearing as if he had understood. Are you asking us to help you save someone? He asked in a gentle voice. Where? Zhang Chengling reached out a finger and pointed in the direction he came from. Sister. Gu. Please save. Her, please. Save. The man dressed in black raised his head to glance at his companion. Well, what are you waiting for? The latter said. 
The man in black picked up the marten from his shoulder and threw it to the fellow in long robes. Be careful. I won't be long, he said before he turned around and seemed to vanish. With anxious eyes, Zhang Chengling stared fixedly in the direction his silhouette had disappeared whilst the man who had remained behind helped him sit up. Close your eyes and concentrate, he instructed. Don't let your imagination get carried away. Salvage your own little life first, before thinking about anything else. Zhang Chengling knew his worries were ultimately useless, so he obeyed the man and shut his eyes. The small marten wriggled out from the man's grasp and curled up into a ball, sniffing the air here and there. The iron-tinged smell of blood was mixed in with a faint aroma of incense that clung to the man's robe. Zhang Chengling gradually lost consciousness while breathing in those scents. It was already dark when Zhang Chengling regained consciousness again. The numbness he had felt earlier had left his body along with the poison. In sluggish moves, he crawled up from the ground. He was still hazy and unsure of what had befallen him when he heard a girl's voice call out. Ha! Ah, you've woken up at last. Joy submerged Zhang Chengling as he twisted his head and saw Gu Xiang. She looked the worse for wear but seemed to have all her limbs. Her wounds had also been cleanly dressed up, and she was at that moment warming herself by a bonfire. A hand covered in calluses reached out from beside him then, and grabbed his wrist to check the pulse there. After a minute, the hand released him and somebody said, the poison has cleared. The person who took his pulse was none other than the man dressed in black. Under Zhang Chengling's inquisitive gaze, the man, whose distant features seemed to be carved from stone when viewed in profile, merely gave him a small nod of the head before he went to sit under a tree, his back as straight as a calligraphy brush. Zhang Chengling noticed then with some astonishment that Gu Xiang was looking at that man with eyes full of reverence. It even seemed that she was restraining her innate raucous and talkative nature. Many thanks. Many thanks to these two brave sirs for saving our lives, Zhang Chengling mumbled clumsily. The man in black gave an almost imperceptible nod. No need, he said before looking away. Zhang Chengling followed the direction of his gaze to the fellow who, during the day, had wielded the crossbow, and who was at present coming back with an armful of firewood. The man in black made to get up, but Gu Xiang plotted over first. Lord Seventh, please sit. Please sit. She said as she hurried to take the kindling from his arm. Tasks like those, you should let me handle them. Why put yourself up to the trouble personally? My job is being a maid in the first place. The fellow she had called Lord Seventh gave her a smile that curved his peach blossom eyes. He let Gu Xiang take the firewood and went to sit beside his companion. From who knew where, the man in black pulled out a small and fine hand warmer and thrust it into Lord Seventh's hands. Then, he deftly picked off the withered leaves sticking to his sleeves. Zhang Chengling didn't know whether he was imagining it, but in that instant, the man in black whose gloomy face bore little difference to a block of stone, appeared as if he had turned into a person of flesh and blood. Even the expression in his eyes became gentler. The pair talked little, but the way they moved around each other gave off an indescribable air of intimacy. Lord Seventh glanced over at Zhang Chengling. Are you better? He asked. He hadn't spoken loudly, but his voice was extremely pleasant. For reasons unbeknownst to him, Zhang Chengling felt himself blush, and he lowered his head. Without a word, he gave a nod, before, wanting to look at that man a little longer, he sneaked another peek from beneath his lashes. The woman who had come to the drinkery the other day had been beautiful, but Zhang Chengling thought that, compared to this person, the woman's face had looked like a painting on a sheet of paper, a mere mask that had been as artificial as it was flimsy. What's your name? Lord Seventh asked him. And the people after why? Before he could even react, Gu Xiang, who was adding wood to the fire, answered for him in a pitter-patter of words. He's my little bro, so his name's also Gu, of course. The two of us, we're servants who run small errands for our master. I'm a maid, and he's a valet. But then our master's family got into some sort of trouble, and a bunch of people from who knows where decided that they'd kill everyone, even us lowly servants. Say, how despicable is that? Even if they have kids in the future, I'm sure they'll be born without bum holes. It's lucky you too. The man in black raised his head to cast a look at her, and Gu Xiang stopped mid-sentence, unable to continue. Her wide open, large eyes shifted all around. Although she'd been making up rubbish, Lord Seventh didn't argue the point. You've both been wounded, he said in a voice that remained amicable. We ought to have taken you to an inn, but the young lady told us that people were waiting to capture you in town and that it wasn't safe. So we'll have to make do with spending the night here and figure out another plan when morning comes. Tell me, do you two have someplace else to which you can go? 
He spoke in an unhurried and gentle tone, as if he were coaxing two small kids. As he listened to that voice, Zhang Chengling felt self-pity overcome him. Was there any place to which he could go? His dad had died, and his entire family had been exterminated. At the moment, bad and good people alike were trying to capture him. He felt like a preyed-upon bird that had already been startled by countless arrows, with wings on the verge of snapping from exhaustion. As vast as the world was, he couldn't find a single place to rest. The rims of his eyes reddened while he fell into silence. Gu Xiang thought it over and piped up again. Actually, we were meant to meet with my master and the little brat's Shifu before that bunch showed up to kill us. That's why we ran without knowing where we were headed. I wonder if they'll ever manage to find us. Reminded of Cao Wei Ning, Zhang Chengling intervened with what he thought was apropos. And there's also brother Cao, he said. He's been caught by a bunch of weird people. Gu Xiang immediately glared daggers at him, to warn the little idiot not to speak carelessly. But Zhang Chengling didn't get the message as he was in his own little world, busy being sad and at a loss. What weird people? Lord Seventh Question. A dwarf and a giant, Zhang Chengling answered guilelessly. And there was also a grandpa and a grandma dressed in flowery colors. Gu Xiang rolled her eyes toward the starry sky, a second from punching Zhang Chengling so he'd pass out again. Lord Seventh, however, didn't seem familiar with Wu Lin personalities. Who would that be? He asked with a start. The Dirt Duke, Feng Xiao Feng in the mountain, the man in black answered from beside him. And the people in flowery colors. Should be the pink matron and verdant gent. He glowered at Zhang Chengling then, his eyes flashing like lightning. Those people are questionable characters, but they'd still be mindful of their reputations. They would never get mixed up with the scorpions. What did you do to have them hunt you? Zhang Chengling choked up under that glare, feeling as if his chest had been laden with a block of ice. But then Lord Seventh chuckled. Little poison, stop intimidating children. The man in black obeyed and lowered his eyes like a monk entering meditation. He stopped paying attention to Zhang Chengling. For a while, Lord Seventh trailed his gaze on Gu Xiang who was visibly on tenor hooks. Then, he turned to Zhang Chengling again. Child, let me ask you, would Zhou be your Shifu's surname? He said all of a sudden. Fearing that Zhang Chengling may babble out yet more information, Gu Xiang cut in glibly. Nope, that's not it. His Shifu surname isn't Zhou, but Tang. And he's a top grade dirty old. Pervert. She hadn't counted, however, on her pig brain comrade in arms. You're lying. My Shifu isn't a dirty old pervert at all. Zhang Chengling exclaimed in a grave tone and while scowling at her. Gu Xiang's finger twitched with the desire to strangle the little brat. Lord Seventh let out a chuckle and shook his head. Where did that impish little girl come from? He remarked. Come on, you can give it a rest. We aren't some villains. Actually, you could even say that your Shifu is an old friend of mine. Gu Xiang's eyes shifted around calculatingly. All right. Can you tell us his Shifu's given name, then? She asked. And what does he look? Like? His Shifu's surname is Zhou, and his given name is. Lord Seventh trailed off, squinting his eyes whilst he pondered. Zhou's issue, the old fraud, wouldn't have used his real name, he reflected. But then, what alias could he have come up with? When he looked up, he met Gu Xiang's large eyes that were staring at him unblinkingly. Finding the sight quite amusing, he remarked on how he'd been actually stumped by that little girl's question. But then a sudden flash of inspiration hit him. He calls himself Zhou Xu, doesn't he? Xu for Willow Katkin, as in body like the transient Yun Cloud and Shroud, hard as the Willow Xu Katkin so dot and he has a brother who's called Zhou Yun. As for what he looks like. Well, I couldn't say what he looks like nowadays because he's made a habit of disguising himself. Although, he never makes much progress. No matter how many times he swaps faces, he always ends up with some variation of a wretched looking, sallow skinned guy. Am I right? He was bluffing. Although he couldn't be certain whether Zhou Zishu would have used the alias Zhou Yun or Zhou Shu, he could guess that it would be the one or the other. Because the man had just about that much imagination. And it worked. Huh? Gu Xiang uttered, still half doubting. Zhou Shu has a brother? In all the time she had known Zhou Zishu, the man was still a mystery to her. Besides her master telling her he might be the former leader of Skylight, she had no idea whence he came from, and where he was going, nor to what school or clan he belonged. She had certainly never heard that he had a brother. She changed tack then. 
Indeed, she reflected that, even though the man wearing blue robes was still an unknown quantity, the man in black was one of the most skilled people she had seen in her life. Even compared to her master, he'd be at least on par. For these two, doing away with her and Zhang Chengling would be as easy as squashing bugs, so they really had no reason to lie. Consequently, she came to believe them. When he saw that his bluff had caught out the two little imps, Lord Seventh lowered his gaze toward the flickering fire. Soundlessly, he laughed. And thus, on the next morning, Gu Xiang and Zhang Chengling left with the two men. Careful to avoid detection, Lord Seventh led them to a counting house. As soon as they stepped into the shop, the shopkeeper, along with a man whose face resembled a ball of dough, came forth to greet them. They called the two men master and great shaman with much reverence. Lord Seventh settled them in and called for dim sum to be served for them to eat. Then, he sat by their side and started a game of go with the man in black. With both men enthralled in their game, they idled their time away till noon, at which time the manager of the counting house erupted into the room. We found Sir Joe. He is here, he said. Lord Seventh tossed aside the ghost stone in his hand and stood up. With a grin, he withdrew his pale hands into his sleeves before saying, meeting an old friend when far away from home is one of life's greatest blessings. Ping in, quick, invite him in.